Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the London School of Economics for what will be, I'm sure, a fascinating lecture and debate, followed by an alumni dinner uh, and a reception generously hosted by Matrix Chambers. I'm Sigrid Rousing, uh, and I've been very pleased to be able to support the LSE Centre for the Study of Human Rights over the past seven years. When I set up my trust in 1995, one of the things I wanted to do was to encourage debate and learning within the human rights movement. The annual program of events, lectures, and seminars which are convened through the LSE Centre play an important role in developing a much needed sense of community amongst the human rights family here in the UK. They've also provided the opportunity to learn from our colleagues in the human rights movement from around the world. The success of this program of outreach, debate, and learning owes much to the vision, determination, and intellect of tonight's speaker, outgoing director, Professor Conor Gierty. Conor Gierty was born in Ireland and graduated in law from University College, Dublin. He was a fellow of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and a professor of King's College, London, before taking up his appointment here in October 2002. He has published widely on terrorism, civil liberties, and human rights. Connor is also a barrister and a founder member of Matrix Chambers, where he continues to practice law. As director of the Center for the Study of Human Rights, Professor Gietti has been extremely successful in developing and strengthening the Center's three core activities, teaching, research, and public outreach. During his seven years as director, the number of students at the MSc Human Rights Program has more than doubled, and I know that many of the Center's alumni are here with us tonight. He has also spearheaded the development of short courses for human rights professionals, indeed engaging with activists and campaigners in the human rights movement, and not only with academics as defined his period as director. I'm sure that Connor's lecture will provoke and challenge us, but there will be some sadness also because this is Professor Geerty's farewell lecture. He'll be handing over the directorship in September this year, although I'm happy to say that his knowledge and insights will not be lost to the LSE since he's moving across to the law department will be continuing as professor of human rights law. Tonight's lecture is entitled, Human Rights After Darwin, Is a General Theory of Human Rights Now Possible? I'm sure that many of you, like me, will have drawn inspiration from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and feel a sense of frustration that the world still has so far to go before we can say we've lived up to its promise. Will a general or biological theory of the origins of human rights help accelerate progress towards a world in which everyone may live free from fear and free from want? I'm reminded of the project which UNESCO undertook in 1947 during the early work on the Universal Declaration in which they canvassed an extraordinarily distinguished and diverse group of eminent thinkers, including Mahatma Gandhi, Harold Lasky, who was a professor of political science here at LSE, Alfred Weber, and many others. Incidentally, uh, out of 41 delegates, there was only one woman, uh, Marjorie Fry from Britain. Um, they asked him on the questions of human rights, which led to a report which set out a list of fundamental rights on which they were all agreed. At a later discussion uh, at the UNESCO National Commission, astonishment was expressed that these champions of strongly opposed ideologies had managed to agree on a list of rights. Yes, they said, we agree about the rights, but on condition that no one asks us why. Tonight, we have the opportunity to explore whether we are closer to knowing why we agree. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Professor Conor Bliethi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sigurd, for that uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful introduction. And, uh, um, I'm delighted to be uh, talking about human rights after Darwin. 
uh, which was a really good title when I thought of it and has become uh, less of a good title. I sneaked in a bit earlier on and I put the clock forward by about seven minutes, so uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to take the clock as five or seven minutes fast to try and reduce the, uh, the pressure of producing a general theory of human rights now. I mean, the answer might be straightforwardly no, and we'd have a lot of time for questions. Uh, so here we go. I, uh, seven, it's seven years ago, uh, almost to the day, that I applied for the job that I'm now giving up. Uh, or one bit of it. I'm staying as Professor of Human Rights Law, as Sigrid has said. Uh, I was a week late, and I only sent in my CV and cover letter because I'd finally taken the advice of my friend and longtime colleague, Francesca Tlilker, as he is up here. Francesca will remember this, I think, who was already well in sconced in LSE. And I turned up at Human Resources, and I made the week late application for this job. At the Center for the Study of Human Rights already existed at LSE. Uh, Francesco was very much associated with it. Uh, Anthony Giddens was keen on it. And Professor Fred Halliday was the inaugural director. I think you know Fred. Yeah. And uh, it wasn't, however, present in any tangible physical sense. And it was uh, uh, an extraordinarily generous benefaction by our chair this evening uh, that made this appointment of a director and therefore of a real center possible. So I can't uh, tell you how delighted I am that Sigurd, uh, Dr. Sigurd Rousing uh, agreed to chair this, because there's a sort of completeness to it from my point of view, which I'm very pleased about. Uh, now, it was, as Sigurd has already indicated, to be no ordinary academic post. It was a new regime within LSE. Uh, intended to be at the center of engagement with human rights, based at the school, for sure, but unapologetically reaching out into the wider world. In other words, it was a dream job. Uh, but my interview, my interview, I don't think anybody here was, yes, yeah, Stan, there, you were on the interview, uh, got off to a bad start. <laughs> there was this guy who's a fantastic guy who shall be nameless. He's a top man, and he's also delightful. He's delightful. The two don't necessarily go together and nor does the fact that he was at Oxford. So he had all three of these. <laughs> but he was, despite all these handicaps, a really good bloke. But the interview starts with him wondering out loud, I wasn't even sure if he was talking to me, uh, saying, given my notorious opposition to bills of rights and to all forms of constitutional rights, why had I applied? Uh, now, this was an entirely accurate summary of my academic work through the 1990s. I had made what a uh, little-ish reputation I had by being a vitriolic opponent of all aspects of rights. I started by hating judges, then I moved to hating philosophers, and then I just hated everybody. <laughs> uh, now, you, some of you uh, will be relieved to know that I'm not going to explain uh, how these positions that I've taken are absolutely consistent. I'm not going to reprise them. I'm not going to go to the detailed analysis of how I am actually consistent and everybody else is inconsistent. Uh, but how could I answer the uh, Oxford professor's job? Well, I was, was I applying because not only was this the dream job, uh, but also because LSE was, as I knew, a great place. It was part founded by, uh, Sigurd mentioned my Irish origins, by the Irishman, George Bernard Shaw, my kind of Irishman, uh, and uh, also, of course, the uh, Beatrice Webb. I have to acknowledge that I'm not rendering the female invisible, having been uh, forewarned by your earlier remarks. Uh, but she wasn't Irish. Uh, <laughs> uh, and also the LSE home to uh, Harold Lasky, who's been mentioned, William Robson, a fantastic academic, John Griffith, still magnificently alive at a great age, a fantastic legal academic, and laterally Martin Lachlan. So yes, it was partly because of LSE, but it wasn't just that. And the answer I gave the professor is an answer I believe even more firmly today, seven years on. Proponents of human rights are believers in an idea, or maybe, given what's coming, I should say, are practitioners of a feeling. And being uh, believers in an idea or externalizing a feeling is not the same as choosing particular ways of doing this. So what matters are equality of esteem, universality of respect, commitment to something intangible, 
almost inarticulate, something which human rights people think of as some sense of the dignity of all. And sometimes these commitments, these ideas or feelings, can lead their holders to skepticism about the claims and capacity to deliver of certain self-describing rights documents. Uh, in other words, the most obvious means do not always serve their declared ends, however flamboyantly they might be framed. So I said I was for the thing that lay behind the documents, and that's why I oppose the documents. I don't think they had the first clue what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed to, seemed to work. Uh, but it's this kind of belief in human rights that has informed my time at LSE. Uh, we've always kept the center away from the lawyers, uh, we've been very happily quartered in the Department of Sociology, uh, where it's been well supported, not only by fantastic academics whom I've been able to know, like Stan Cohen here, uh, but also a succession of conveners who have been very supportive. Uh, convener is the LSE word for head of department. Uh, sadly, now gone. None of us ever knew whether you spelt it with an O or an E. Uh, Nick Rolls, Dick Hobbs, and Judy, more recently, Judy Watchman. Uh, and we kept it in sociology, not because we hate all lawyers uh, or want, like Shakespeare, to kill them all. Uh, I couldn't say that when I have supportive colleagues like Christine Schinken, who I think is not here because she's in Gaza on behalf of the Human Rights Council. Not a bad excuse for non-attendance. Uh, and Chiloka Biani, who's chair of my advisory board, not here because he's been asked by Kofi Annan to seek to crack the problems of political malpractice in Kenya. Uh, these are the kind of lawyers we have at LSE, so we don't want to kill them. Uh, but we at the Human Rights Center think that lawyers can be so powerful that we should place some hindrances to their natural tendency towards institutional colonization as a group, towards disciplinary empire building. So one of the things I've done, which I've been most pleased about, has been refuse to move the center into the Department of Law. I think that's where, as you can see, I'm setting out a manifesto for the future as well, of course. Uh, that's been very, very effective, I think. In the critical early months, though, before I'd even properly come in, I mean, I do need to acknowledge some people towards the end of my seven-year tenure here. Uh, and I want to just mention, following uh, around here, uh, LSE, the then acting director, Professor Peter Townsend, who's down here as well, uh, we were wandering around the school in search of premises into which to put this new center. And we had... Dr. Rousing's benefaction, so we felt empowered. And we were shown places that seemed to me to be in Hackney and places, <laughs> uh, places that seemed to me to be in other cities altogether. And I was saying, these are fine. And Professor Townsend was just saying, this is outrageous. And then we got to the perfect suite of offices, which I couldn't believe they were so marvelous and accepted them. And Professor Townsend said, these are also outrageous. He said, these are filthy. These are disgusting. So we got the whole place made over. Uh, and it's uh, a former kidney hospital uh, <laughs> on the site. And now suitably decked out in the center colors of green and blue, which was my first huge fight when offered the 17 different shades of gray from which to select as an act of autonomy offered me by the school. I said I wanted green and white and blue. Uh, this is where we still are. Every six months or so we're told we're about to be demolished. Uh, we ignore the email. And it, it has yet to happen. It has yet to happen. Uh, but I just, uh, the center wouldn't be what it is today without Peter Townsend, I have to tell you that. Uh, because he also had the brilliant plan of using the wonderful generosity of Sigrid to leverage uh, more school support for uh, an extra post. And the arrival of Joy White, who I'm delighted is also here, as our first center manager, was largely the creative initiative of Professor Peter Townsend. And it was Joy who was the prime mover behind so much of what we did in those first years. And in Joy and her successor here, Zoe Gillard, uh, both here tonight, you know, I'm delighted, I've been exceptionally lucky to find two centre managers, to have had two centre managers, whose administrative skills have been matched by vision and with whom it's always been a pleasure to work. So we are celebrating a centre which has been created not by one person but by a number of people of whom two have served successively as managers. And then there's been the students. Uh, uh, it took about three years for it finally to get through to me.
that uh, centres at LSE are not supposed to teach at all. We shouldn't have had any students, apparently. This is what departments and institutes do. But one of the great virtues of being confused is that I, I didn't know this. Uh, and by the time I, I learnt it, uh, I had already started three new courses. Uh, I doubled the numbers on the MSc programme. And I brought in Harriet, who can't be here because she's not well, Harriet Gallagher, uh, as our new postgraduate administrator in place of Catherine Worthington, who had gone back to academe. So, Sigrid, you have no idea how often you protected me because I was able to say, well, I, of course uh, I wouldn't teach, but you know, I have this quite difficult benefactress who is <laughs> insisting on all this teaching activity, praying they wouldn't ever check, but you would have said it's important. Uh, the result of all of that was I was able to bring uh, extraordinarily good academics into the Center for the Study of Human Rights, fantastic people, and some of them are here, and I'm gonna notice them before I get into the talk properly. We have Gert Oberleitner here, uh, who was my first guy on the international law side, Claire Moon, who's on sabbatical and not here on the sociology side, she does all that Weber, I think is his name, or Dirk somebody <laughs> stuff <laughs> that I'm bemused by. Uh, and, and Margot Solomon has taken over from, from Gert. And we have Alistair down here, uh, Cochrane, who, and he succeeds Ivan Minoka and Nick Gio. And one of the pleasures has been to have a young uh, team of true scholars. Uh, if, uh, just, they've written, each of them has written monographs, uh, of the highest quality in aspects of our field. And that's been an especial pleasure. And they've done it all in the midst of the teaching. And the students uh, have been wonderful. And we've been, and this is coming to the thrust of the talk, because this is sort of where the reflections come from. I read all these personal statements. The students uh, have to write a statement about uh, why they want to do the MSc in human rights at LSE. And we get, I have to tell you, I mean, we get hundreds of applications. We get an amazing number of applications from all around the world. And uh, this is overseen by Sarah Ulfspar, who's also here, and also by uh, uh, Candiel, who might be here. I think he's here. He's coming to the dinner. Address. So we have an MSc administrator as part of the team, too. And they get all these applications ready for me. And it's these personal statements that really matter, because mostly these people are brilliant academically. Uh, but we're looking for people who've also engaged in society, active in society. So we're lucky here. We can choose a coterie of people who are both very able and very committed. And the point I'm going to get to now is, what do we mean by very committed? And what does that tell us about the meaning of human rights and how does Darwin help? Because these applicants have a common theme. The applications I read have a common theme, the personal statements. And it can be summed up in four words. I want to help. Their writers will already have helped in some way or another. Amnesty, a small uh, NGO they've started, an internship maybe at an international organization. But they want to help some more. They want to join the UN. They want to go into civil society after they graduate, equipped, they believe, this is why they apply, with the human rights knowledge to do even more. And this even more is invariably to help people whom they don't know, whom they have never met, and who may well be from entirely different ethnic, national, or cultural backgrounds. The only common bond is their shared humanity. My students personal statements never say that they want to do the MSc in human rights in order to analyze more deeply the meaning of autonomy in the work of Immanuel Kant. Sorry, Alistair. I know you want them to. They don't. <laughs> uh, nor do they ever say, I've always wanted to come to study human rights to study Habermasian ideal speech conditions in a free society. They do other courses. Uh, nor, Margot, sorry, do they want to look at whatever the convention is that has produced the latest rapporteur. Sorry, Gert, they don't want to do that stuff. Uh, though they often write about terrorism, now, thankfully, the waning war on terror, uh, they are never detached. You never get a feeling from these statements that they are interested as spectators. They are active, intellectually as well as community-wise. Uh, but nor are they luxuriating in cynical despair. So they're not like normal... Uh, I was going to say sociologist, then I thought I better stop. <laughs> Slipped out. Uh, 
Uh, the students whom we celebrate this evening, with, there's a dinner for the alum guys, and uh, there's, a, there's a drinks party for the rest of you, by the way, uh, which has been, which has been uh, sponsored, is the right euphemism for spending money to do it, sponsored by Matrix Chambers. And I see the chief executive, is that what you are, Lindsay? Chief executive is there. So there's drinks for everybody sponsored by Matrix Chambers, where I am. So it's lovely that Matrix has done that. Uh, so we're celebrating the students, and we're celebrating all of you, but my students are believers in good and doers of good. And good here is not some piece of fancy scholarly jargon. It is the consequence of empathy. It is in Adam Smith's, first of my two quotes from Adam Smith, fine phrase, what flows from changing place in fancy with the sufferer. Now, Stephen Copgood from SOAS has written a good book, a very good book about amnesty, Keepers of the Flame. And he finds an analogy with the religious movement to be a very strong one about human rights. Uh, human rights has its holy days, 10th of December. It has its saints, Eleanor Roosevelt, Peter Benenson. It has its martyrs, Sergio de Mello, Archbishop Romero, too many, sadly, to mention whose names we don't know. It has its missionary orders, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch, I think, was the kind of Jesuits. Uh, <laughs> that was meant as praise. Uh, it has, tragically, it's got its crusades, Iraq, and it's got its inquisitions. Uh, the human rights professors who support institutional ill treatment to save the souls of civilization. But we are not a religion. Uh, Jesus is not our guide, nor is Muhammad, nor are any of the great leaders of any of our world faiths. In answering the question, why do we care, we are on our own. But if we can answer this satisfactorily, we are well on the way to understanding the power, I would even say the magic, of the term human rights in its contemporary usage contemporary usage. Uh, Tom Stoppard has said, quote, human rights simply endorse a view of life and a set of moral values that are perfectly clear to an eight-year-old child. And I think that is, a, in a profound way that I hope to explain this evening, uh, correct. Perhaps even, I think he understates it. I think it's a bit old. And why, why have a child? Why stick to the human? Uh, as I've, I've said this before, the human rights movement, in my opinion, is a visibility project. Its goal is to get us to see people truly as people, and therefore, each of them as entitled to right treatment on account of their humanity. Over time, and across cultures, this project of care, because of what is seen, has gone under, continues to go under, depends where you are, continues to go under different labels. It might be protected by the benign power of God, or of reason, or of custom, or of law. Or these days, in many places, as with our students, it takes a human rights shape. But all these structures and terms and arguments and habits are not reasons to care or explanations of why we care. Rather, they are ex post facto rationalizations, explanations after the event of a propensity to care that precedes them. We are not persuaded by our brains to care we care because of the way we are, not because of what we think. Now, three and a half years ago, I stood in this expect spot at yet another, you might say, public lecture, and wondered about whether we should not worry so much about where this caring tendency comes from, and whether we should just rejoice in its existence consciously refusing to ask seriously about its origins, lest we should find none, 
and end up thinking ourselves out of the habit. I had this idea that we should start to remask ourselves and we should end with Nietzsche and begin to regarb ourselves with superstructures to stop us getting at truth, surround ourselves with beliefs. But I think that was wrong. I thought it was wrong then, actually, and I think it's even more so today. That was the autumn of 2005. And I noticed in the autumn of 2005 that it was the 196th anniversary of the birth of Charles Darwin. <laughs> That's my way of saying I've had this idea before everybody started thinking about Darwin. <laughs> the 196th anniversary, pivotal. And uh, I went on to propose the great naturalist, one of my heroes, for human rights canonization as our movement's secular savior. I did that three and a half years ago. I want to think a bit more about that now. That's what I want to work through in the time I have left. Now, I don't know if Professor Dawn Oliver is here, but there's a super piece she's done. Uh, she's from UCL, so it's an amazing example of altruism for me to mention it. <laughs> Mutual reciprocity, I guess I'm gambling on Dawn if you're here. Uh, what, if anything, do the sciences of human nature have to offer to constitutional law? That's Dawn's fascinating title. Uh, and uh, Professor Oliver says there is no evidence that specific human rights, freedom of speech, association, religion, etc., are genetically favored. And I agree with her. Uh, what I'm talking about, what I'm going to talk about, are underlying dispositions. Uh, and here, I was fascinated to see that Professor Oliver and I are in very close agreement. Uh, our joint interest is in evolutionary psychology, which, to quote Dawn, seeks to identify the evolved psychological characteristics of humans with this process generating predispositions, psychological traits that are heritable, and are manifested in the brain's neural architecture, which were adaptive when they evolved in the sense that they contributed to successful reproduction. So we're thinking about evolutionary psychology, feeding into dispositions, which then are expressed. Now, I think there's an important difference between this approach and traditional approaches to law, human rights, philosophy, uh, I think this approach starts with feelings and ends with reason, rather than the other way around. Uh, there's a great book by Jonathan Haidt called The Happiness Hypothesis, and he does a brilliant performance on TED on the web, and he has this analogy of an elephant of feeling being controlled by the rider of reason. Uh, nature gives us the first draft of our lives, and reason, experience, and plain luck do the rest. So which, pre which predispositions matter for human rights? If we think of ourselves not as members of a special species, but as each of us composed of a bundle of genes on the lookout for survival, and inside I to Helena, who's here, I'm delighted to see that we're not people, that's far too big, we're genes on the hunt for survival, then it, it by no means follows that in this field we have to commit ourselves to the rather loaded idea of the selfish gene. There are many routes to survival, and not all of them are marked me alone. The way we are is not all self-oriented. Uh, Adam Smith put it like this in 1759. How selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. Now, what I think Darwin allows us to do is to take this insight and locate it within the sciences and see it as part of an animal rather than a uniquely human approach to living. I really believe what I'm going to say now, because I think it's a key thing, but it's, it's controversial, I think. Far from being something spilt into us from birth, from which we learn how to behave, 
the building blocks of morality are, as the great primatologist Franz de Waal put it in his Tanner lectures, evolutionarily ancient. That's why I think Tom Stoppard is conceding too much when he says that the child needs to be as old as eight, or indeed, that he needs to be, or she needs to be a child, as opposed to a gorilla, a chimpanzee, a dolphin, or an elephant. Here are some more provocative words from de Waal. This is a quote. The evolutionary origin of this inclination is no mystery. All species that rely on cooperation, from elephants to wolves and people, show group loyalty and helping tendencies. These tendencies evolved in the context of a close-knit social life in which they benefited relatives and companions able to repay the favor. The impulse to help was therefore never totally without survival value to the ones showing the impulse. Key sentence. But as so often, the impulse became divorced from the consequences that shaped its evolution. This permitted its expression even when payoffs were unlikely, such as when strangers were beneficiaries. This brings animal altruism much closer to that of humans than is usually thought, says de Waal. Following the logic of this, he then asserts, quote, empathy is the original pre-linguistic form of inter-individual linkage that only secondarily has come under the influence of language and culture. The way empathetic tendencies like these influence our behavior is not conscious in the sense in which we ordinarily use that term. Uh, Pascal Boyer's book, which Helena passed me on, describes it in his highly innovative work called Religion Explained, The Human Instinct That Fashions God's Spirits and Ancestors. He says it's, it's a bit like the same as deciding how to stay upright. You do not have to think about it, but a special system in the brain takes into account your current posture, the pressure on each foot, and corrects your position to avoid a fall. In the same way, do specialized cognitive systems register situations of exchange, store them in memory, and produce inferences for subsequent behavior, none of which requires an explicit consideration of the various options available. I'll come to him again, I think he's, but I want to say where does all human rights fit in all this? The intuition to help others that I read about by the score on this argument is the product of an evolutionary dynamic and its offshoot into a more general empathy and outreach to the other that DeWall has described. It's clearly close to the desire to help that I see year in, year out in all these applications. But it's not the only feeling that bursts through the human subconscious into our active selves. Of course it isn't. There are and always have been other propensities at work, powerful ones that assert the primacy of the in-group over the other, that may start with kin support and then move quite quickly into hostility to the stranger. In fact, as we know all too well, even today, this sense of the solidarity of the group frequently collides with efforts to engage a wider empathetic response to the plight of others. I would go so far as to say that the universalistic tendency is a weak one in comparison with that which focuses our attention and solicitude in the direction of those we know, or at least know of, our family, our kin, our community, and which knowledge fosters a solicitude which then underpins and reflexively legitimizes hostility to others. Indeed, it may well be that we learnt morality by bonding with those we knew. 
thereby rooting such mutuality, at least partly, in a shared antipathy to the outsider. If that's the case, then de Waals puts it like this, the profound irony is that our noblest achievement, morality, has evolutionary ties to our basest behavior, warfare. As a mere secondary growth, a spin-off without direct evolutionary purpose, empathy for the outsider, leave aside mutual reciprocity, will always be delicate and fragile, perpetually at risk of being overridden. To maintain a commitment to others, even within communities, is not easy. The reach towards the other is certainly at its strongest where close family is concerned, but gets progressively weaker as it moves away from our direct relations into wider kin and then into community. This is how uh, the philosopher Philip Kitcher describes the emergence of language, because I'm thinking about how has this impulse survived. Philip Kitcher says this, there began a process of cultural evolution. Different small bands of human beings tried out various sets of normative resources, rules, stories, myths, images, and more, to define the way in which we live. Some of these were more popular with neighbors and with descendant groups, perhaps because they offered greater reproductive success, more likely because they made for smoother societies, greater harmony, increased cooperation. The most successful ones were transmitted across generations, appearing in fragmentary ways in the first documents we have, the addenda to law codes of societies in Mesopotamia. The law codes mentioned here are one of a number of what Pascal Boyer calls, very helpfully I think, commitment gadgets. Gadgets, commitment gadgets with which we have tried to tie ourselves down to follow the better long-term part of our nature. Now the point here I appreciate is about a spin-off from mutual reciprocity, which develops a new head of steam as society evolves, and the attractiveness of harmony and smoothness over potential vi perpetual violence becomes apparent. This has strong explana explanatory power so far as, say, somebody like Thomas Hobbes is concerned. And indeed, it explains a lot about the authority of law. But neither Hobbes nor law, of course, speak necessarily on behalf of the outsider. Mutual reciprocity and smoothness more easily produce walled cities than open societies. So to look for a commitment gadget that ties us to that better part of our nature marked empathy for the outsider, we need to look elsewhere. Religion fulfills an obvious function here. My colleague at Birkbeck, Costas Dizinus, one of the best writers in human rights there is, has written about how early Christianity undermined classical hierarchies. Uh, this time last year, we had Archbishop Rowan Williams hold a spend bond on the interaction between religion and human rights. Uh, the Christian religion is, of course, rooted, at, rooted in the nobility of dying to redeem others, and at a more practical level, stopping to help others. Not only Christ on the cross, but the Good Samaritan as well, in whose unintended reproachful shadow many of us of a certain age will have lived out our childhoods. Literature too, uh, literature as well. Uh, the great now sadly uh, deceased Richard Rorty who died recently was a great believer in the power of literature and the power of education to create the kind of atmosphere of compassion that we hated the language of human rights. Uh, Recent work on the Victorian novel, according to the newspaper, has claimed that good writing helps us to evolve into nicer people. And also custom, religion, literature, custom. Uh, in his most recent book, a wonderful and short book, uh, Moral Relativism, Stephen Lukes, also often around here, speculated that, quote, perhaps when we are in the grip of custom, we are motivated by moral emotions that are indeed natural or innate, which developed because they helped individuals spread their genes. They sounded alarm bells, offering reliable, immediate responses to recurring situations. 
And then he says, rather dramatically, I would never say this, I think, but I can quote it. Perhaps we prop up these emotional responses by elaborating deontological rationalizations with talk of the moral law and rights and with categorical and inflexible moral rules. Thus, it's uh, perhaps in there, but Stephen Luke's is suggesting that philosophy could be reduced to the status of a mere flying buttress for the cathedral of feeling. The reins held by the rider of Jonathan Hyde's elephant. Is this where Ted Hondrick's principle of humanity comes from? Or even Martha Nussbaum's capabilities approach? Or all these intellectual approaches that people are developing to resolve the problem of poverty? Control gadgets put in place by clever people and believed by other clever people as reflections not only of their brain power, but also less consciously of an ethical fuel that makes their brains work in the particular way they do. Religion, literature, philosophy. When people talk of common humanity these days, Stephen Luke says in his book, they speak the language of human rights. In our contemporary culture, human rights is the best commitment gadget available to those whose life project or immediate ethical task is the generalization of the propensity to help the other into something beyond kin, beyond immediate community, beyond nation, into the world at large. It is the habit of mind that flows from the far-seeing activist's capacity to grasp that in our shrunken world, we are all affected by actions in a way that requires us all to be seen. The island people whose homes are destroyed by an inundation precipitated by first world greed and recklessness are the contemporary equivalent of the newly arrived neighbor whom some grunting but imaginatively wired pre-linguistic human types thought it better to befriend and help rather than to kill. The term human rights works so well to capture this feeling because it is multi-purpose. Making sense at the level of philosophy, this is why you ought to help the stranger. The level of religion, our church believes you should help the stranger. You go to hell if you don't. Sorry, that was a cheap aside. Uh, it's much more complex. Politics, uh, they have a human right to this or a human right to that, therefore you have to give it to them. And law, of course. What they want is a right set out in the charter or the constitution. Now, very few ideas have this multidimensional appeal. And of course, each of them can spin off in the wrong direction, you know, obviously. Uh, philosophy into a kind of analytical aridity, all that autonomy stuff. Not, I mean, autonomy is great, you know, but I mean all of it. Politics can turn into a kind of inflation of rights claims. Law, which I know a bit more about, into an over-reliance on litigation. But these wrong turnings into cul-de-sacs are inevitable in a journey as ambitious as this. An effort to persuade the world that it is indeed a village and that the unknown stranger is as worthy of my care as my blood brother. That's a big task. Now, Costas Dusnes describes the human rights movement as the ongoing but failing struggle to close the gap between the abstract man of the declarations and the empirical human being. I would put it as the ongoing effort to create a basis for promoting the better parts of our nature. It is a difficult project. As I said, it's fragile compared to other natural propensities, which are more direct. Uh, it'll never be perfect, but I don't think it has to fail. Costa says it's a failing struggle. I don't think it has to fail. Costa's business's word struggle is important, and it, it introduces 
uh, a further but crucial dimension to the appeal of human rights that I couldn't end this lecture without taking explicitly into account. Human rights would not have succeeded in the way it has if all it were were the law and practice of niceness, of Comtean altruism. The human rights story told fully is not all about givers, it's also about takers. There is a large-scale subaltern tradition to take into account, a tradition of solidarity, of resistance to the abuse of power, and of the assertion of right in the face of immoral might. The visibility project is about the powerless stepping into the light, as well as about getting the powerful to have better eyesight. Now, you wouldn't expect this to turn up in LSE because this is part of the world of power. We are part of the world of power, but this is an important element in human rights, an assertion against power. This makes sense of why odd things are celebrated in human rights. This is why Magna Carta is in all the human rights books as an achievement. That dreadful document. The chief baron standing up to King John. That's what matters about it, not the content. That's why Kant's reworking of a Christian ethic into secular shape is a breakthrough for human rights, uh, which means we kind of gloss over his odd views about the human, you know, which ones qualify for what, and how you have to be especially good at things or you get zapped. It's not embarrassing because Kant's innovation, what we like, is mainly about power, wresting authority from the church in favor of the people. Uh, this revolutionary dimension to human rights becomes explicit with the American Declaration of Independence in 1776, and even the fact that a bunch of these people were owners of slaves has not been able to dampen the enthusiasm of later generations. We're looking for something different. We're looking for a resistance to power. And the same with the French Declaration of the Rights of Man uh, and the Citizen, still celebrated as a founding text, uh, despite not only how vacuous it is, sorry, but also the violence which the new regime sanctified uh, by it very soon unleashed. This connection with agitation, protest, destabilization, violence, has always been part of the human rights story. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 acknowledges as much in its preamble. It doesn't explain human rights. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right about that. But it does announce the necessity of their protection by the rule of law, quote, if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression. This perceived necessity drove the anti-colonial insurgents of the 1950s and the 1960s, just as it does many of the climate protesters and eco-warriors of today. It is because of a concern about human rights that many have come to accept, perhaps even argue for, intervention in the affairs of human rights abusing states. Uh, a live issue, I think rightly a live issue, until you know, one of the many disasters of the Bush presidency Sure, because it showed how easily this could be abused. But it's unlikely to remain forever off the agenda of human rights activism. Uh, just like Christianity before it, the human rights crusade follows logically from belief in a universal dream and one that in extremis must be sufficiently important to warrant in position. So we'll be back to new planned crusades because of the logic of our universalism. This strand to human rights the second of the two strands, is a discourse of power. It is because of it that we here at the center have felt so comfortable in the Department of Sociology. Power must be harnessed, controlled, and reduced. The new power structures that rise up to replace the old are then subjected to the same process of criticism and required to be reworked in still fresher ways. George III is replaced by founding fathers who are replaced by a Supreme Court, the landed are superseded by the democratic parties whose exercise of power gives rise to calls for 
counter-majoritarian mechanisms, Bill of Rights, which leads to anxiety about judicial power, and so on and so on. So I have these two strands to human rights, the givers and the takers. Is there a connection? Well, even Michel Foucault felt compelled to protest for solidarity and against Franco. Human rights makes resistance to power possible, gives a name to a feeling of deep antipathy. This is a move you may not agree with. Since it is too glib to say that all power is always wrong, we need to know why certain exercises of power are bad. And to know this, we need further to have some underlying sense of right and wrong, some way of knowing why we should protest against this abuse while not regarding some other action, either as an abuse at all or as one that should warrant our attention. I am not talking here about protests to protect self-interest, hunting people, you know, or fathers for justice, or those people who want free petrol <laughs> to drive up and down the motorway. Uh, what I have in mind are the kind of people who see the need for change on behalf of others as well as of themselves, and who are brave enough to take the risks required to seek to achieve it. They are radical opponents of oppression, not defenders of an unjust status quo. Now, revolution is rarely a sensible option for a person whose DNA is made up of only selfish genes. Resistance and even political violence in pursuit of the rights of all can be a dramatic example of ethics in action. So too is a march in support of an occupied people whom most have never met, or a gathering outside an embassy in the name of the disregarded citizens of a country of which that building is a part. Our understanding of what it is to be human makes sense of the affront we feel at an abuse of power, whether directed at our own community or at a people whom we merely know of. It is what legitimizes our anger, possibly even, as the Universal Declaration foresaw, our violence. It is when the feeling of pain at bad treatment of oneself and one's kin fuses with the active engagement of the outsider that you have the potential for a human rights revolution. In the old days, we might have called it nationalist or socialist or democratic, but nowadays, it is the idea of human rights that springs to mind first and has most traction. Now, it's, Sigrid's mentioned, and I've said it already, that the drafters of the Universal Declaration were determined not to inquire into the meaning of the document they were drafting. And that's exactly what I've been trying to do here. And I think, I mean, it's, I think we have a, a working idea about the possibility of an explanation for the stuff that flows out of human rights. Its power is the way it can play at so many different levels among the givers and how it is so attractive to the takers as well. And the language does all of this work. Uh, I end with uh, the final sentence in The Descent of Man. This is what Charles Darwin wrote. We must acknowledge that man, with all his noble qualities, with sympathy, which he feels for the most debased, with benevolence, which extends not only to other men, but to the humblest living creatures, with his godlike intellect, which has penetrated into the movements and constitution of the solar system, with all these exalted powers, man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origins. And a good thing, too. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, Connor, for an extremely stimulating lecture. Very, very interesting indeed. Um, I'm going to take questions from the floor, um, but I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to ask the first question. I have prepared a question on the basis of your title. <laughs> um, and I'm speaking as an anthropologist, really. Um, and needless to say, as an anthropologist, I'm due to bound to profoundly disagree with you um, on several issues. This, to me... Uh, That's not the prepared bit, regrettably. <laughs> uh, this, to me, really is about cultural relativism, isn't it? And it's about the difficulties that we have with cultural relativism and the, the failures that we have to, to really answer the question within the human rights movement that non-Western nations come up with from time to time, which is that you know, this is a deeply Western movement. Um, there is a Chinese way or an African way or a Muslim way, which is different, which doesn't necessarily include our human rights tradition. Um, I was thinking um, about the debate uh, in New Scientist about the religious gene. Um, they've had several pieces uh, about the discovery of a religious gene, um, which seems to me from an anthropological point of view to ignore the very many different ways and forms and emotions that we have of being religious from intensely personal relationships with a single God, um, to explanations, myths, narratives about human origins. And it seems to me that in a similar way, we risk becoming reductionist if we ignore anthropology and history in this debate. Um, human rights, to me, is deeply culturally constituted um, and a very specific Western narrative Claiming universality for it on the basis of genetics doesn't seem to me to quite address the problem, which I would say, but uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, is about what I was talking about before. You know. um, so whilst I'm sure that the wish to do right is, is innate and encoded in our genes, and as you say, expressed in a tendency towards altruism, hospitality, and competing with the competitive and destructive tendencies of human nature, but I think, in a sense, I suspect that even the genetic argument is more ethnocentric than we perhaps think. So my question is, is even the meta theory that you talked about itself an expression of a specific Western tradition, which finds explanations for cultural phenomena within the body, as it were, it's a kind of autopsy that we're doing on ourselves. Is science a neutral meta-narrative in the light of the less than neutral Western history of science, including um, the, so, you know, the, the quote-unquote scientific underpinnings of racial <coughs> difference, and so on. Right. Uh, thanks, Sigurd. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know why they're laughing there. I don't know why they're laughing. I'm just pausing in a polite way. Uh, first of all, the religious gene strikes me described like that as just plain silly because uh, there are so many different kind of varieties of people involved in something called religion. So I am with you there. And as, as I said early on, there's no such thing as, well, I didn't say it, but there's no such thing as a human rights gene. So you can't operate on all my students and isolate a peculiar gene that's foremost in their brains. Uh, the propensity to care is my big thing. And the care drives people with power, but also underpins people without power to assert both their own interests and the interests of their community. And I say that's general, and I say that's a spin-off from the way in which we have evolved with certain commitments to mutual reciprocity, which have spun into something bigger. And so I see the human rights people as people are trying to make our community bigger and bigger and bigger. That then manifests itself in different shapes and sizes, in different places, in different cultures, in different forms. So it's something that's always, for example, annoyed me was people would say, Britain needs a human rights act because Britain has no human rights. And they would say this 
when there was a, a welfare system which was fantastic when there was equality of opportunity with free education. And now we have human rights, we're okay, but we don't have free education and we have uh, little access to medical care. But, and there's that way in which I think human rights can sometimes obsess about the term and regard the presence of the structures as enough in itself. And that's sort of where I was when I was critical of the human rights stuff in the past. So I think my ideas have a route to engaging with other cultures in a way which gets us away from discussions about whether Article 28.4.F, as understood by the committee, which is a committee of a bunch of academics from universities with a few token people from other universities, is human rights. And we relocate the discussion uh, along the lines of how does your community assist in this propensity? And then there's a difficult question of irreducibles. I, I think there is a very powerful sense in which we fight for prohibitions on certain treatment towards certain people. So I think we're not consequentialist or instrumentalist. So we, we as a community, fight to protect each of us. And that, that may be a challenge. On ethnocentricity, I don't know. I just don't know. But I think that's a really good debate to be having, that we then engage critically with our colleagues who work in the field and we ask those kind of questions, and we are utterly aware of the misuses of certain assumptions in, about nature in the past. I, I was in last year in Rwanda, and you can't go to Rwanda without being forced to remember the advances in the 1930s that involved the Belgian measurement of skulls, which then reified so-called tribal difference, which <coughs> produced disaster later, of course, but equally, I don't think I can prevent myself from going where my reading is taking me on the basis of such abuse, you know. I mean, and so, but I think that's the kind of discussion that human rights can have, which could really push the subject along in a certain direction. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take questions from the floor. Uh, if you want to state your name and affiliation, that would be great. You don't have to. Yes. Connor, my name is Eric Fripp. Um, I wonder if there are some problem. Uh, I wondered whether your general theory of human rights is actually a theory that suggests that human rights are general. Because human rights seem to be extremely political and situational. And the biology equally, or the uh, lessons of evolutionary psychology seem also to be very experimental and very based on particular situations. I wonder whether there's what in, in Nietzschean study is sometimes termed the risk of um, evolutionary narcissism, that is of assuming our present situation to be a norm. To be a what, Eric? To be a norm. Oh, right, okay. Uh, I don't think I misunderstand our present as a norm in that way. Uh, I think that human rights can only be understood by trying to get behind the ways in which the language is used to try and identify whether there's some essential feature of it. And so it's been in that spirit that this lecture was presented. So I've accepted the political and the situational, but tried to understand what drives it, not content with the answer, discourse is all. Uh, I don't believe that I've ended up extrapolating from a certain moment, which is about us, into a general statement about humanity forever, except insofar as I have laid out my stall on a side effect or consequence of evolution, which has produced this, as Boyer calls, a kind of ref a unconscious reflexive sort of sense of a feel for other people. And I've been thinking through that. Uh, I don't believe that is just capturing this moment. I believe that is something which, since we began to speak, we've been trying to understand. Yeah. But 
evolution is, is about ability to reproduce. And I live in one society. Um, as you know, I'm a refugee lawyer, and my clients live in very different societies. And uh, it, it may well be that ability to reproduce in Somalia or Afghanistan is deli delivered by wholly different behaviors or attitudes from those which, 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 which are said to deliver uh, in a sort of averaged way in, in, in a developed Western society. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there is a question. About, it, it, there there it, is a question about Eric, as he's now revealed, of course, as a student with whom I've met, had many interactions about this kind of subject. He's, he, I'm allowed to say that now because he's revealed that he knows, we, I know him, but uh, we've had chats about this. Uh, and I think an awful lot does depend on the culture in which this uh, uh, sense of engagement to the other has opportunities to take root, and cultures can make it absolutely impossible. Uh, but I just didn't develop that theme here. But there is a theme about the interaction between the environment and the propensity. Certain places, this propensity almost disappears and becomes eccentric and impossible. In other places, more successfully, it becomes the norm. On reproduction, I see it as the genes rather than the person. I'm going to take another question. Um, red T-shirt. Yes. No, you. Yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Alan. I'm a, a, one of Connor's PhD students in the law department. Um, just following on from the points that have been made in the two earlier questions, is there a possibility that there is sort of a general evolutionary strand that's perhaps humanity-wide and then sort of culturally and community-specific ideas happening also? I mean, if you think about other genetic ideas, even you know, skin tone has to do with how much sunlight you had 2,000 years ago or whatever it might be. So perhaps European ideas of human rights have been very heavily informed by the collective experience of the Second World War, perhaps the United States, its collective experience of the American Revolution and subsequently the American um, Civil War, whatever it might be. So maybe what you've identified here this evening, Connor, is a, a broad evolutionary trend which may have different sort of context, locally specific evolutionary developments, and that perhaps that is a way of extrapolating out and perhaps bridging some of the gaps that have been raised. Yeah, well, Alan and I spent a week working on that question, so I'm very grateful that he was, <laughs> I'm very grateful he was called. I, I asked him to try and catch the chair's eye after a particularly difficult series of questions. So, <laughs> but, uh, he, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's right. And uh, I, 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 I think how it plays out is then an issue that engages not only which language is used and how it is used, but what structures it takes the shape of. And it happens to take the shape I've been describing today in quite a lot of places. And so it's a reflection on that rather than any claims about the language of human rights <coughs> being necessary to this. The, following the logic of it, as I wrote in a piece before Christmas, you have to accept the language of human rights could disappear because it, 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 this work has been done by other structures in the past, and we could frame new structures that would take the place of it more effectively. I, I have great concerns about the ability of human rights to translate into any kind of effective political program, for example. And so I'm not convinced that it's particularly the best way of protecting these kind of uh, inclinations, but it's what we have at the moment. I had a question up there. Yes, Hugh. Hello, this is Ozan Shakar. I used to be a student here about four years ago in the philosophy department. Um, my question, it, your, your discussion sounds a bit like the, you know, the Cambridge philosopher G. Moore. When he was asked what is good, he, when he was asked to define good, he said, well, good is good, and that's the end of the story. So when you say, like, what is human rights? Human rights is, well, human rights, you know, human rights are human rights, and that's a bit like the end of the story. And then you, and he was accused of being a bit of an intuitionist, and people used to ask, you know, where are those intuitions coming from? And back then, they didn't really have the tools to explain this intuitions or empathy in terms of the evolutionary argument. But um, my problem with that is a bit that when you talk about, okay, we are still using the language. When you say about like human rights, it's, that it's not just you want to do you know, what is good. You also choose to do what is good. But I mean, if that is the case, they are basically saying that when, you know, the concept of choice simply disappears when you start going into this evolutionary argument. So you basically do things because you are somehow programmed to do that. And, but what happens when you choose to do otherwise? You know, what happens when you do wrong, for example? 
And how do you actually show people that they are doing wrong? I mean, their argument can be exactly the same that, well, I'm just evolutionary program to do this way. You know, how, how, how could you actually like refute those arguments? And if you are getting so, you know, a bit of like trapped within the evolutionary argument, where does like objective reasoning come into force, for example? You know, like if yeah. they are doing wrong, you could, if you are re using reason, you could say, look, this is the logically compelling thing to do. What you are doing is wrong and you could show them right. But how do you do this within an evolutionary framework? Yeah, thanks, uh, especially for the reference to Moore, because, yeah, I absolutely was interested in that line of inquiry. Uh, Jonathan Haidt again talks about how we shouldn't really be looking for either or uh, in an individual. So uh, we think of both and. And actually, religions have been much better at this than we give them credit for often, that we have got not uh, an automatic response, which is driven by a propensity over which we have no control. Some people instantly do, up to a point, because we say they're malfunctioning. But a lot of people have got uh, these uh, conflicting propensities. And so at that point, the issue is about the fertility of the soil in which this person finds themselves. And uh, their moral choice is informed by propensities, but also by their culture and by their environment, and ultimately is free choice. But it's a free choice which takes place against a background of a partly formed individual. So it's, I think you're right on, on, narrowing, on narrowing the space for free will, but there is free will there. And in the lecture three years ago, I actually used an analogy from religion of a good angel and a bad angel. You know? But religions are quite good at seeing contrasting parts of the self and having to resolve the actions that you do as good or bad, knowing them to be either or. Yes, over there. Uh, hi, um, Bart Storin, uh, LSE alumni and fellow Irishman. Um, <laughs> I just, uh, it struck me during your lecture that um, you mentioned philosophy, religion, politics, law, and the discipline that seems most um, notable in its absence was economics. Now, I'm no economist, but from my r limited knowledge of uh, economics, uh, it's based on an assumption that the individual is rational and self-interested. So if human rights as a movement, as you've posited here tonight, is based on a kind of uh, a general feeling of selflessness or altruism or whatever word you want to put on that, uh, and economics is or isn't based on self-interested action, do you see them as fundamentally con contradictory or do you think that there can be a synthesis between the two? Well, I left out a whole section of my talk on how... Thanks, Bart. They're, they're giggling, I think. But... Uh, uh, about how economists have to deal with the problem that their tests don't always work out as they should work out if people behaved as they jolly well ought to behave. Uh, and there's interesting kind of complexities in game theory on that, you know, where they try and work out why people didn't do what they're supposed to do, uh, which is act selfishly. And our colleague here at LSE, Lord Laird, has written a whole book on happiness, where he, if he's and would be a very distinguished economist trying to understand uh, why there's more to life than what many economists tell us. So I think there is, uh, I hope there's not too many economists here. Uh, so it's another route in to an inquiry that I would like to have. Early on in my center, center here, we had some economists come. In fact, uh, I think it was Tim Beasley came, who's now on the bank thing that decides on interest rates, to try and work out uh, economic approaches to happiness and human rights and growth. And we need more discussion like that to try and work through the kind of uh, implications in your question. Yes, over there. Thank you. I'm uh, Francesca Clark, who persuaded Connor to put in that late application. <laughs> um, listening to you, Connor, reminded me um, of sitting in this uh, very room 30-something uh, years ago when I was a student in these hallowed walls. And I, I remember that moment when, just as I thought I'd got to grips with understanding Marxism, you have to understand in those days, it didn't matter what subject you did, we were all learning Marxism. <laughs> um, just as I got to grips with it as a understanding Marxism as a political movement, I was then told it wasn't about politics at all. It was actually about science. Uh, the Marxism was scientific, it was an inevitable, and it was determined. Well, you can all judge whether that was an entirely accurate description of the development of that particular approach. But my quarrel, perhaps, uh, 
with what you say, which I found exceedingly interesting and compelling and could have gone on listening to you for very much longer, was, that, was actually not so much the theory um, of, of altruism, but the conception of human rights as being fundamentally a project about individual emancipation um, and reciprocity, and that it ignores the fact that certainly post-Second World War, I would suggest that the idea of human rights has evolved increasingly into a project for creating the good society, uh, a project which has been influenced, to answer some of Sigrid's points, uh, by communitarian notions coming from non-Western philosophies as much as the original individualistic enlightenment idea that first propelled human rights. Uh, that's one of those questions where you sort of hope it'll go on and on while you try and work out how to answer it. <laughs> and then what it does is stop, uh, which is always disconcerting and well done. And I could certainly have listened to you for a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what I was working out in my head was that uh, I could make a case for a good society being delivered within the framework that I proposed, uh, but I'm anxious about communitarianism. So the good society, I would say, is one in which this propensity to give everybody a chance has been firmed up in the culture and has been reflected in its institutional mechanisms. And it has led to a society where the better side of our nature is uppermost and structured in a way which causes people to have good lives. And I think that's a very sophisticated version of what today we might call human rights, but what I would prefer to call social democracy, which I think of as a manifestation of the same capacity to organize. And when I referred obliquely to my anxieties about the human rights inability to engage in politics, I had that in mind. But the communitarian uh, anxiety I have is about an irreducible in human rights, which I hope I stressed, which is that you reach outside your community and you engage uh, with the, the kind of people that Eric works with, the asylum seekers, the refugees, uh, the people who have nothing. And I wouldn't want a community which has delivered a good society for the insiders but which is bonded in its dislike of the outsider. And I would not regard that as a human rights society, even though a good society, and I know you wouldn't. And therefore, I have thought of human rights as a kind of cosmopolitan campaign to try and have a good society on a global scale. Okay. I've, I've I've got Thank two you. last <laughs> questions. We've got five minutes left. One was up there, I think. Yes, you. Um, I'm Ariane, and I'm a student here at the Centre for Human Rights. And um, you mentioned Michel Foucault resisted Franco, and it made me think about um, when Germany was engaging in its own, quote, war on terror, unquote, when it was uh, prosecuting the Red Army fraction and uh, with the white cells and prisoners of the Bandermenhof gang. And um, in France, uh, Deleuze wanted Foucault to sign a kind of declaration uh, that called uh, Germany a fascist regime. Uh, regime and he refused to so and they didn't really speak up until he said so okay my question from that is that Deleuze and the group there in Collège de France was acting from a feeling towards protecting the oppressed in their minds the prisoners that were kept under very humiliating conditions and under your theory of human rights do we confuse motivation with justification? And how do we reply to the one that wants to limit liberty and supports her arguments with reason rather than feelings? Well, uh, I mean, there's a sort of motivation is about explanation as to why something happened. And justification is about explaining why it ought to have happened. And those two to me anyway, are different. Uh, I think we're not brave enough sometimes to acknowledge that uh, what we call terrorism today, political violence, violence for political ends, is often a kind of, it's, it's a, it is a form of altruism. It is an incredibly 
dramatic, selfless thing. Uh, and in the context of the Bader Manoff, who had very successful middle class kind of lives, would have been able to carry on without that. So I think we need to be, at least I think we need to be respectful of what drives people to engage in such violence, because it isn't commercial gain. And the two types of people who do it, the types of people who rise up because their own lives are crushed, and the types of people who empathize with those whose lives are crushed. But even the first type, if they're that kind of person, they will often have been able to get away or make their lives in some way separate from their culture. So they choose to represent their cultures. And I think we could do more in acknowledging that maybe this is one of those cul-de-sacs of empathy, like I mentioned, the lawyers who become too pedantic about the law, the philosophers who become too caught up in the minute, and therefore respect the motive whilst being in the context of the Federal Republic of the Germany, and I would say many open democratic cultures, uh, not contemptuous of the justification, but extremely firm in rejecting the justification. Okay, one last question. Yes. Uh, just, wa uh, just wait a second, Raymond. Thank you. Uh, Raymond Perrier, uh, MSc alumnus, and not a fellow Irishman, but a fellow Catholic. Um, <laughs> unusually for me, unusually for me, Connor, not a religious question. Um, I was pleased by the way that you, uh, you situated uh, right in a, in a broader context, but worried that where you ended up, and particularly because of the association with Darwin, you end up being unable to draw a, a, an appropriate border or boundary on where those rights might go. Um, I work for CAFOD, and we've just done some research on people's propensity to care, their willingness to donate, and a significant number of people will give to help the poor, the powerless overseas, and a large group of people will give money to help the poor in this country, an even larger group of people will give money to help animal welfare charities. So how do you deal with that in your context of human rights rather than just rights? Right. Thanks, Raymond. And uh, this is our last question. Yes. So yes. I'm supposed to reveal some practical matters yes. related to the consumption of alcohol at the end of this question. So if I don't do so, remind me. Yes. Uh, I think there's, there's a lively question that you've astutely picked up of MSS and which flows out of my talk, which is about what's it got to do with the human? And why stop at the human? And uh, I think those are big questions to discuss. And I would not be afraid of acknowledging that we might be in a bigger project than a human rights visibility project. We're in a project which is about animals of which the human is a part. And that has manifested itself in organizations like Compassion in World Farming and has translated into, and Britain was a leader in this, legislation to prevent the cruelty to animals and not be at all worried about that and celebrate it as a, a further imaginative leap. After all, we got, or at least, I mean, to, 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 to give you a, a an analogy from a religious background. You know, we had to try and engage in explaining why the Native Americans, as they were not then called, the Indians, as they were called in the 16th century, were not animals. That was, uh, that was a very imaginative and important breakthrough, but it may be time to say, well, even if they had been, you know, and talk about animals. Or when, as recently as the 19th century, we had to try and persuade people that people uh, who were not white were not property. They were human, you know. So, we have had uh, these efforts at persuasion about what is human. And it may be that we also should not be afraid of or engage in efforts of persuasion about where this feeling of empathy should lie. Why should we not? Cycling down to Holborn, I had, there was a truck in front of me which had all these screaming animals in it. You know, and you don't think, oh, no, I don't want to hear that. You know? Why shouldn't I take the place of the suffering? animal there. Now, I wouldn't be afraid of that at all. I think your starrier question, and especially the point about CAFOD and so on, there might be a slight hint of, we have a pie, and uh, we, 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 we don't really want to talk too much about animals, because we want a bit of the pie for us. And I, I, I would absolutely acknowledge, if that were a slight anxiety, that we should push to try and vastly increase the pie, 
you know, as a culture, we have a job to try and change our culture so that things become normal that are not normal today. And that's where these things about living sensibly or living frugally or these ideas about getting back to non-commercial ways of living are important because that would free up lots and lots and lots of the pie. So that's a slightly subsidiary point in answer, I hope, to the first question. Uh, now, will I wear my centre director hat? Yes. Okay. Uh, the instructions are modestly complex, which is why, in a reckless move, I was entrusted with them. Uh, there are people present who are attending a dinner, and I'm now supposed to say rather ominously, you know where you are going. Uh, and we would ask you uh, to go there. Uh, the, the reason is, one of my proudest boasts with Joy first and then Zoe is that at the centre of the study of human rights, when we say to staff that we're going to show up at a certain time, uncharacteristically, we show up. So we have always had a record of trying to work within the time, and that's why I'm suggesting that you do that. Uh, but thanks to the generosity of Matrix Chambers, uh, we have a reception for those of you who don't know where you're going to go, <laughs> because I'm now going to tell you where you're going to go if you choose to, which is the atrium, which is a wonderful space here outside the, the hall, just outside it. You don't have to go anywhere, just to, uh, and, and have a drink on uh, an organization of which I'm extremely proud to be a member as well, Matrix Chambers. So those are the instructions. Over to you, Chair. Can I just say thank you very much, Connor, for very stimulating.